My guest today is one of the top baritone saxophonists in the music scene today, Jason Marshall. In our conversation, we discuss the making of his latest album, New Beginnings, which is fantastic. His big band arrangement, which failed in grad school, but was later recorded by Roy Hargrove. Healthy keys for the baritone saxophone, how he warms up with ballads and why you don't need to play on a vintage horn. I put a link in the description to jasonmarshalljazz.com where you can purchase his albums, arrangements, and see upcoming concert dates. Enjoy. Jason, yeah. great to see you Likewise. again. And yeah. it's funny because I just saw you a few weeks ago. <laughs> right, 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 right. But in, in person, we were, in we person. were both at... Um, John Ledbetter's shop in New York at the same time. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, he's um, he's one of the people I trust the most in this music industry because he's never he's never not doing a good job. Hmm. You know, he's always making a real effort to do the best possible work. So I appreciate that. Yeah. And he's such a nice guy. Right? Yeah. 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 As well as a great saxophone player. Yeah. That helps. That helps. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and it's funny because when I was, when we met up there, you had mentioned something about the previous interview we did almost three years ago now. Yeah, it's been a while. About something you said in that interview. Oh, yeah. That, that, <laughs> yeah. That, yeah, that, yeah. I got a lot of people yeah. bent out of shape or whatever. Yeah. And it's it's interesting. So what it, do you remember what you said? Uh, if I recall correctly, the, 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 the statement I made, in the in context was simply that uh, a vintage saxophone wasn't needed to achieve a high level i just said you don't need to, you don't have to play a vintage saxophone there's no reason to do it like if you want to that's fine but you don't have to play one to become some sort of high level artist you know yeah. you your artistry exists quite independent of the instrument that you're playing yeah yeah, yeah so. and for the record, I, I totally agree with you. And I I mean, I interpret that as meaning just because there's this sort of concept out there, yeah. whoever started it, that vintage saxophones are better. It, it's, you know, it's not, I don't agree with that, you know. No, um, and, and I, don't, I don't think that that's even a long held idea. Um, I was, I was taught, uh, I was taught that that started in the 80s the idea of playing an old instrument. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I was told, hey, look at pictures of Coleman Hawkins, look at pictures of Sonny Rollins, look at pictures of Charlie Parker. Look, you'll never see them playing a horn that much older than than the year they were living in. Mm -hmm. Because that, that it was understood that when saxophones come out, they're generally better than the last ones. Yeah. So that's what that's what people did. And I and I heard that it started in the 80s with Kenny G and then um, Kenny Garrett playing an older saxophone and I think Joe Henderson playing an older saxophone. And so that, you know, that kind of caught on at the beginning of the Internet and, you know, uh, mm. images started to proliferate. And so people thought that because of the oh, also Michael Brecker. You Michael know, Brecker, yeah, a lot yeah. of people, David Sanborn. I'm just thinking about correct, those, correct, the people right? Like the people, time. the people who were who were who were gaining popularity, at, at also when the the internet was becoming popular, that 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 you know it kind of caught on like that, and so with what they call mimetic ideation, you know, like the stuff exponentially go, frankly, goes viral, right? And then now mm -hmm. people say, well, I got to have an eighty six thousand tenor, yeah. um, or I got to have a you know, a con baritone because this one played it, or I got to have a whatever. And it's just been my experience that after a certain level of proficiency, not only does it matter, but no one cares. No, no, no and, and, difference, no, really. it, well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> like on, only saxophone aficionados could even tell, okay, that's a con baritone versus a Selma baritone versus a Martin baritone right. versus a brand new Yamaha versus a P. Marriott versus a whatever right yeah. but I, what i mean is on a recording no if i'm listening to your last recording i'm and let's say you switch saxophones i'm, yeah. like, no. I'm gonna be like wait a second there's something yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Not right here. And, and the thing is if if someone were to notice it would have to be you who's been playing the saxophone 30 years right yeah. like 
it would it takes right. that, which is not most right. people. So right. so it doesn't matter. Yeah. So yeah, no, I so I, I just wanted to uh to bring that up, not to rehash an old topic, but no. just to say that I agree with you on that. <laughs> I appreciate that. I and, and, and yeah, not to cut you off, but I, I, yeah. I wasn't trying to make a I wasn't trying to, you know, uh lay down a, a law or anything. I just wanted to release people of the of of the pressure of having to afford and manage the expensive maintenance on a saxophone. Like you just you don't have to do that. That's all I'm saying. That's right. It's like a public service announcement. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, really. That's what I was on. So cool. Uh I wanted I really the reason I wanted to talk to you is because the other day I'm checking out some new music and I came across your latest album that just yeah. came out well, a few weeks ago. November, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And I listened to it and it was fantastic. It is fantastic. I really Thank enjoyed you. listening to it. And I, and I immediately wrote your message like, hey, can we um, talk about this and sure. help get the word out? Because I think everybody that plays, definitely everyone who plays saxophone should listen to it, but everybody who's just into good music should check it out. So you're on this label, what is it, uh, Seller Live? Seller Live, yeah. yeah. What can you tell me about that? So Seller Live is is a, Corey, a guy named Corey Weeds, uh, from, and he's, he's Canadian. And he makes trips to the U.S. frequently. Uh, to hear music, to record music, to perform music. He's also a saxophone player. Yeah. And uh, he he mentioned to me that during the pandemic, he felt compelled to do something that would have a social impact where the plight of Black Americans were concerned. And so he felt in his capacity as a musician and as a producer, the way he could best help the cause was to record Black musicians. Now, I found this out after the fact. He he was in New York on some other business and he happened to go he happened to go to hear the Mingus Big Band at Django. And I, I was playing with the band and uh, it, it was kind of kind of nostalgic the way it happened because I you know, I just I hadn't heard of things happening like that except for reading liner notes or old copies of Downbeat. But he said, "Man, I was I was at uh I was at Django, see the Mingus band, and I hear you stand up and play this baritone solo. And I uh I reached out to Jeremy Pelt, who was working with him as a producer, you know, for the for these records also. And he said, Man, we got to record Jason Marshall, like right away. And so Jeremy Pelt's a friend and mentor of mine. So uh Jeremy Pelt called me the next day and said, Hey man, Corey Weeds from Cell Alive wants to record you. So let's put it together. And it was it was quick, you know, I said, okay, cool. You know, he goes, here's your budget. Uh, you thinking, you know, piano or organ? Cause I have three records out, you know, as a leader with organ. And I said, well, I think it's about time to do a piano record. He says, okay, find a rhythm section. And uh, so I called the people I knew I could trust the most. And uh, that that was then and now, that was uh, Willie Jones the uh, third, Gerald Cannon and uh, Mark Carey on piano. And tell me about the um, so the session that how, were you there in there for a few days? Did no, you do it all in one no, day? No, no, no. Again, this was a real vintage kind of way to do it. Uh, Jeremy, he said, "Man, have some tunes." Uh, I said, "I think I think it's time to do a standard record." He says, "I agree." So just have have some little things, have some little arrangements, you know, you know, polish them up, make make sure you you're strong on them, and and and. Fortunately, I've been able to develop sort of a a collection of songs that I that I play, right, in ways that I do them, right. and I've been able to see based on the responses I get, ver based on the way the the arrangements have developed, um, what what lands well and what doesn't. So I said, okay, I, I, and and during that time, I had so much going on. It was the it was January of this year. And, you know, snowstorms affected things and we couldn't rehearse. And I had so many other things going on just in life. Um, you know, I told the guy, I said, we're not the band. I, told, I said, we're not going to be able to rehearse. But here's what I got worked out. Here's how we're going to do them. Here's the keys. And uh, Jeremy said, if you like it, I love it. Let's go. And we went into the studio. Uh, it was Rudy Van Gelder's, you know, the 
famous, you know, hallowed. Yeah, that was my studio. next question. Was where did you record? Yeah, it? Rudy Van Gelder's. And um, well, because yeah. it sounds this the recording quality and the mixing and mm -hmm. the, the, everything sounds really good. Like sounds really really good, which always helps, you know, when you got good music and yeah. then add that other level of polish to it. Of course. And it also, it's, it's in, in the tradition of, you know, what that sort of music yeah. should sound like. So it's, yeah. Yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. I don't want to use the word it sounds vintage. I don't want no, to no, say No, 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 but I, I know what you mean, though. It yeah. sounds the way it's supposed to sound. Yeah, it sounds, it sounds like it was created by people who know what it's exactly. supposed to sound like. So the, the thing for me that is so special about this recording is that my last recording was done at Studio G by, uh, and the in engineer was Richard Salino. And I was totally satisfied with that recording. I was so happy just with mm. the way everything, with the mix, the recording, how I felt in the studio. Like, I just couldn't be happier with my last recording. And so when this opportunity presented itself, uh, I just didn't imagine there was any room above that last recording. Mm. And I'm so happy with this new recording. You know, it's, it's, it's just really meaningful to me because there, there was always ways to, to, to create another satisfying result. Mm. And, and I'm, man, I'm just so, so happy with it. Cause listen, I went into the studio asking for the same mics with the same mix and all of that from my last recording. And Maureen Sickler, she 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 heard me and we started just the way I asked. And you know, I I between uh you know Maureen Sickler was the engineer, Don Sickler was there, he was just cordial, he didn't really have any input. Uh Corey Weeds was there, he was cordial, he was helpful, but he didn't really have any input. Um Jeremy Pelt and I discussed music. But they they were very uh, respectful of my agency as a band leader, so they didn't they didn't we didn't argue we didn't I mean, it it, it was just beautiful. And, and Maureen she goes Jason, I, because we started we started with ballads when we recorded, and she said Jason, uh, I like the sound we're getting. Do you mind if we try something else, just to see? And I can't remember the microphone model, but it was two Neumanns, not the not the 67 or 87, two smaller ones that I had never worked with before. And she set them up as a pair. And for whatever reason, it just added this additional dimension to what it, to, to what I was doing. And it also meant that I didn't have to aim at a microphone. And it created sort of this, this like, almost like a, a bowl of a microphone that I could play into. And it, it just, it just worked. I said, yeah, let's, let's go with that. Nice. And, and that was it. Yeah. Well, it sounds beautiful. And everyone uh, listening now should definitely go check it out. And now, now that you have some sort of a, an idea about what I, I love talking about records like this, and then you can go and listen to it again. And then, ah, now, you know, like the back, yeah. the back story between, behind it you're playing on your, your the gear your p moriat so yes yeah, it, it's a it's a p moriat uh low a dark lacquer um strictly speaking it's a jason marshall model p moriat uh that's a special order option if if people want to do that uh, but it's it's their it's their low a um and it's the instrument i've developed with them since 2006 you know and um uh it's a Jody Jazz DV number 10 mouthpiece that I've been playing on for 15 years. Yeah. Rico Orange Box number four uh, reads and a Ravner Platinum ligature. And that's, I mean, that's been my setup for forever, yeah. forever. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great setup. I have the, the, I love the DV on Barry with that Ravner Platinum ligature. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's it works. Setup. It works. Okay. Well, so the, what I'd like to do. I wanted to maybe ask you to kind of go because it's a standards record. Yes, a standards record. exactly. And it's a great selection of standards. I mm -hmm. love standards records. Um, yeah. As you know, everybody does. Uh, maybe you could kind of talk about 
the, these different tunes, maybe there's like a like a reason why you play different ones and you could kind of just go through that. Um, or, if, you know, if there's a special meaning for any one of these tunes or you, you picked this up because you were playing, I don't know. You know yeah. The, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, well, uh, let's see. The first tune is recorded. Recorder right? May. Yeah, no, I'm 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 thinking. So so recorder may I, I got in the plan because one of my teachers, Howard Johnson, plays it. He played it. And you know, he just it he just always had this real strong impact when he played that song. And so him and a late friend of mine named Marquez Adams that I went to college with, he was a great saxophone player. He died really young, but he also played that song. And so it's it's sort of just been in in me in my ears and around me for a long long time and so I just knew at some point I had to record it and um, I'm I'm you know I'm real careful about drum and bass solos during my set also during the recordings that I do and so rather than just solo solo and at some point have a drum solo at some point have a bass solo I like to frame it in a way that keeps the listener engaged so. Recorder May starts off with a way to frame the drum solos. So that's that's how that ended up on there. All right. And then I, you, would, I think, well, you got, um, I could write a book. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I could write a book. So I could write a book is a song, um, you know, from, you know, the classic Miles Davis recordings. Uh, and I listen to that song when I'm working out. And the Miles, it, Miles version, you mean? The Miles version with, with John Coltrane on it. And it's, you know, I would put on the record, and when the record was over, when the workout was over, that's the one I ended up singing. And the high from finishing the workout makes me want to sing. Okay. And that was the song that that uh, that always that I always ended up singing. So that's why that's why I had to record. Okay, great. I love those are like those blowing changes. To yeah, change. yeah, like, yeah, exactly. Fun to play, right? Exactly. And then I know I'm just going through the ones that I yeah, know yeah. off the top of my head. So then there was the one, there was one of your originals. So yeah, Miss Garvey, Miss Garvey. If I'm known for any song, it would probably be that one. Uh, Miss Garvey is, uh, is a woman, a, a dear friend, and I went to college with her in 2001 and two, Florida A&M University. And I, I want there to be a more salacious story to it. But <laughs> there, honestly, there isn't. She's just a friend and her last name is Garvey. And the, the, way, I would, the way I would address her when we saw each other on campus, I would say, Miss Garvey, Miss Garvey. And so I needed, I needed a song that was a shuffle that, you know, sort of a what we might call a finger popper you know what i mean just something to clap your hands stomp your feet and so i started writing this thing and while i was writing it i saw her and i said miss garvey miss garvey and so that ended up being the title and it got it got some recognition because roy hargrove recorded it on his big band album mm -hmm. uh and you know people who have who have seen the band and or heard my big band perform it they'll know that as uh in grad school, I wrote the big band arrangement as an assignment and actually failed the assignment and the course. But I just kept it because I liked it. And so when, <laughs> Roy, started, <laughs> when Roy started playing it. <laughs> wait, wait, so wait, but that was just, a, was this in uh, at Queens? Yeah, Queens College. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's interesting. I didn't know that part. Yeah, yeah. But that's I'm trying to remember so that I must have been yeah. uh I must have played it. Yeah, in the, must have in the, in the... must have. Must have. Okay. And uh so that's that's how uh you know, so here's the thing. I had I had recorded Miss Garvey on my very first album in I want to say 2006. But other than Roy, I hadn't played it that much since then. And I certainly hadn't recorded it since then. So I thought it would be it would be a good addition to this. Um, to just have a real strong shuffle on the album. Yeah, it's a great tune, and I love the I love it in the quartet arrangement. I mean, it just sounds so good. And that was the one I was listening. I was listening to the album, enjoying it, and I heard that one. I'm like, oh man, this sounds so good. You know, and then I, I'm like, I got to post it to Instagram to tell other people to check it out. And then 
but yeah, the whole album, the whole the whole thing is Thank fantastic. You. Thank you. Uh, um, there's Arigen. Yes, right. Yeah, there's Arigen, uh, and I remember one of the first experiences I had when I moved to New York. I went to St. Nick's Pub, and Wayne Escoffrey was playing, and I said I wanted to sit in. And he says, okay. And he calls Arigen so fast, <laughs> so fast. And I remember playing it when I was in, when I was at Florida A&M and I thought I, I could play it a little bit and he calls it and it was so fast. And I just said, okay. I remember that moment. I said, one day I'm going to get this right. Uh, and I did. That's a good story. Yeah, those tunes, those tunes that like beat you up, and then you, you come back. Yeah, <laughs> to, to yeah, uh, yeah, you know. yeah. Get your lick in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Good one. Yeah. yeah. And what about some of the other ones? Uh, so, so there's Black Orpheus. Oh which, yeah. Which um, is the theme song to to a movie uh, who whose English title is Black Orpheus, and um, I. Honestly, it's not like a the movie itself is not a super meaningful movie to me, but I remember it because it was the last movie I rented on VHS. <laughs> and and and, uh, and and I remember I want to say um Jerry Mulligan recorded Jerry Mulligan recorded it and then I through that recording I found out it was a theme song to a movie so I just rented the movie. And it was it was a you know um, a Brazilian movie with Portuguese in Portuguese with English subtitles and wasn't that interested in the movie visually it's, it's kind of interesting, um, but I I just always liked the song, you know. Mm -hmm. And if I'm honest, I I didn't I was never in love with Jerry Mulligan as a saxophone player, but I appreciated his way with melody, you know, and so there's a couple of things that he's done melodically that struck me. And this was one of them. So I mm -hmm. wanted to make sure that I could record it. The, 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 the tricky part was that I already had recorded me on the album. And th those are both typically done as bosses. And I knew that um, we'll, we'll get to this. Uh, Peggy's blue skylight was going to be on the album. And, um, the one compromise Jeremy Pelt and I made was that I, we were going to do it slower than I really wanted to. And so in order to, to create some dimension, some, um, some variation on the record, uh, we, we agreed to do recorded me faster, just a little faster than I was going to do it. We did, um, black Orpheus as a waltz and, you know, Mark Carey just, just, Put a thing on it that was just so beautiful it just sort of kind of made it for me so we did black orpheus as a waltz and um that sort of created the different kinds of uh presentation that i needed for the album nice uh okay and then there's so yeah you said you did peggy's blue skylight the yeah Mingus. yeah peggy Mingus. peggy's blue skylight is uh you know playing baritone in the Mingus band, I have to say moaning is, is probably my favorite thing to do with the band. But other than that, it's Peggy's Blue Skylight. No question. I just love playing on that song. Mm -hmm. And the way we recorded it was a lot slower than I, I had a mind to do. But Jeremy Pelt, it's, it's the only time he said, hey, man, because uh, I counted it off fast. And, he's, and he comes out of the booth. He says, hey, man, I want you to I want you to put it right here. And I was like, yeah, yeah. He said, trust me. And I said, okay. And and I'm glad I did. I'm glad I did. So that that's and 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 people don't really record Mingus tunes. So I knew that in in so doing, I could I could shine a light on that legacy. Cause I mean, never mind, it's one of you know, he's one of the most important composers in American history. Um the, the Mingus, you know, the Mingus name, you know, Sue Mingus and I mean, my late teacher, Ronnie Cuber, just that whole thing is is one of the ways I, I, I got on the scene. So I had to I had to do something about Mingus. Right. OK, cool. And then 
And then there's Fallen Feathers. Yeah. That's so, it's Quincy yeah, Jones. Yeah. Quincy jo yeah, it's one of the one of the things he wrote, I guess, back in the 50s. And it, it's not clear to me right now if it came out before Parker's mood or after Parker's mood. Uh, and and there's there's the, the they share that same melody. Um, so I'm not sure which came first. Okay, but it's I mean, called, yeah, it's, listening to it to me with the title, I was like, oh, there's got to be something to do after, with Bird. But, well, that, that's what I thought, but I've also heard that Bird heard him do it, which is why he played that uh -huh. because it's just at that time where he could have heard it first. Right. Yeah. That's super interesting. That'd be good uh, to, to get to Trivia. the bottom of that, yeah, of that sure. little mystery. For sure. For beautiful. Sure. That's a beautiful tune and great selection and not one that you hear, you know. No. So I anyway. heard it. Yeah, I, I heard it um, via Cannonball Adderley. And the album is, I want to say African Waltz. It's one of my favorite albums. Um, so I heard I heard Cannonball do it. And I also heard Jesse Davis do it. And Jesse Davis is so strong and expressive and beautiful on that song. So when I heard it, I said, I, I got to do that one. I got to do it. And I actually, um, I had the great fortune to play with Dmitry Kolesnik and Steve Little during the pandemic a lot. We played out in Central Park uh, in the area that they call Seneca Village. Um, and that was one of the songs that I brought to that, to that situation just to practice it you know I, I, I transcribed it off of the off of the uh, cannonball record and that's how i learned to play it and then you got one more on here i'll never stop loving you isn't that something didn't cannonball record that one as well so i don't know so here's here's how that that came came about i actually don't know where i heard it first but i remember being at Cleopatra's Needle, which was a well-known jam session. Um, yeah. It kind of ended in the uh, early 2000s. But that's where I met a lot of the folks that I ended up working with. And I heard it somewhere in my life. And I, I, I remember asking Jeb Patton, the piano player, I said, what is this melody? And, and I sang it to him. And he says, he starts, he plays what I sang back to me and he says that sounds like I'll never stop loving you and I said okay I just kind of filed it away you know and then I heard Houston Person do it as a ballad then I heard Jeremy Pelt do it as a ballad but for whatever reason I didn't hear it as a ballad for me and so uh, I made it you know I, I, I just I wanted to record it in the way that I heard it and that's the way it is on the record. All right. You know? Wow. So, and, 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 you know, that's a, that's a song that I should say, that's a tempo that I hear often avoided on recordings because like it's technically for me, technically it's the same up tempo and ballads, especially if they're going to double time on a ballad, it's about the same thing, but to play medium and stay medium, mm -hmm that's what I would call a more mature thing to do. Like improvise on the tempo that the song is at, you know? Right. Uh, so I, I felt strongly that, I, that something like that should be on the record. And that's a song that I, you know, that I've sort of been stewing for a long time. So, yeah. Yeah. It's a great collection of standards. Great. Uh, you know, I, I, you know, when you, and that's the thing. If you're going to do standards, like, okay, which ones? There's so many to choose from, and you have to carefully think about each one and then kind of have it go together as a group and in an order and, like, yeah. and have different tempos and different grooves and all yeah. that. Well, yeah. I mean, that that, that was, for me, the, the the thing that I, like, I wanted to cover sort of the, the range tempo-wise, but I also wanted to make sure that I, I picked what I would call healthy keys for the baritone. Because a lot of times you can play a song well, but it doesn't lay well on the instrument. And so you don't get as much 
you know, kind of bang for your buck? Because mm -hmm. you plan a song that you like, but you plan it on an instrument, and the instrument doesn't really like the song. And and in for that, me, in that particular key, you yeah, mean. yeah, yeah. And so I felt strongly that I should think long and hard about what keys to play the songs in. Because another thing that I've always done, uh, where possible, is to is to take songs through the keys. You know, one to just practice improvising in different keys, but also to figure out where it what songs lay most effectively, you know, on the saxophone and in which keys. Yeah, that's pretty cool. You know what? So yeah, this kind of leads us into another thing. I'd love to hear, like that's one aspect of it, but maybe you can go more in depth in what you're thinking of in terms of, okay, this, these are the, these are the areas I'd like to avoid if I, if possible on the baritone melodically for whatever reasons, maybe mm -hmm. you can kind of get into like, into that a little bit more specific as a baritone, a technical yeah, baritone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so for instance, with baritone, with a low A baritone, the A is going to speak more, more authoritatively than the B flat. Okay. Now, to me, that's less of an issue than I hear talked about on the internet. Like, I, it's not like the B flat on my horn is stuffy. It's not, but it speaks with a different syllable than the a does because the a has a flair to benefit from whereas the b flat does not okay so if if that's the case then playing songs in f where the bottom of the horn is the five which is a you know playing songs in d the bottom of the horn is the five that's stronger than if you play songs in g flat where the bottom of the horn is you know concert d flat our you know e flat to b flat on you know with the e flat sure. transposition um, so that, that was a consideration. Now, if I'm playing songs in concert D flat, I'll be flat. I don't avoid that. You know, I, I play songs like that a lot. Um, but for whatever reason, D flat and F are stronger keys on an E flat instrument than concert G flat. You know, now it's stronger on alto than baritone because on alto, the bottom of the horn is the five of the G flat chord. Right. It's that, right. that, that concert D flat. So, you know, and then I'm thinking about like how to use the, the palm keys and where they will speak most effectively. So with palm keys, you got your D, you got your E flat and you got your F. And I'm thinking of those notes. So D would be, you know, that's your that's the one of your concert F. That's the five of your concert B flat. That's the seven of your concert G. So those are like healthy, healthy keys from I mean that's you know, that's that's a yeah. that's a uh a term I learned from Tim Price. Like he was like, play play songs and healthy keys for your saxophone. You know, and you know, where the the, the majority of the melody lays in the middle of the instrument, where the top can be the top the you know, one, three, five. The bottom can be one, three, five. So when, mm. so when I say healthy keys, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. And I guess, so on a baritone, like for playing melodies, is yep. there a, is there a range that you, that is the sweet spot? You know, obviously melodies, yeah. they, they cover a certain amount of range. Sure. Is there like, I don't like to get in the palm keys when I'm playing melodies on Barry, or I like to get in the, you know, is there a Yeah, yeah. Like that? I mean, it really depends because for me, you know, I think it's fairly well known that I use as much of the instrument as I can, right? Now, I remember as a kid talking to Nick Brignola, and he would talk about being able to unlock parts of the horn. You know, one of those, um, he, he, he'd say, figure out ways to play G altissimo G sharp real, real strong. Because if you can hit that note, everything on either side of that is unlocked. And so, um, like, for instance, if you play, if you're playing Overjoyed by Stevie Wonder on the baritone, at the end, the last, uh, the last chorus, you got to go from out, you know, out, out to small F sharp to G sharp, but it's got to be really strong. So, or you can, or you can just not do it but in order to to really do the song justice you got to have that together 
So in terms of playing, like I play so much R&B on the baritone, I got to have more than I would available to me if I was just playing jazz. Uh, but, you know, it's all part, it, it's all part of the Black American experience. So it's not like you really can delineate in a way that is helpful. You just got to have, you got to, the horns got to be available to play all the music. Mm. And, you know, the, the middle of the, in, the middle of the saxophone is a great, is a great place to put and leave a melody, right? That's just what it is now because it's baritone and I'm thinking of baritone singers in order to get the lyrics out, they stay in a particular range. Okay. So with baritone singers, uh, you, you know, you got your Joe Williams, you got your uh, Johnny Hartman's, and then more, you know, later on, you got your Peebo Bryson's, you got my favorite Luther Vandross. You know, I would argue Al Jarreau is a baritone. Um, the thing about the baritone voice is that it tapers in a certain way. They all taper in a certain way. So as you get higher up, the, the thing, baritone instruments, baritone singers, the notes tend to taper above a certain point and in very particular ways. So uh, middle D, kind of like middle D up to palm key D is where most baritone singers will put all the, the, the notes because that's where the words will come out most effectively, right? Because, you know, some singers will say, I can sing the note, but I can't say any words in that hmm. range. And right. so that informs how I, how I decide where to, where to put melodies. What is your fingering for the G sharp altissimo G sharp? It well, it, it depends on what I got to do. If I have to, if I have to hit it and stay there, then it would be the one and three, and the one three and G sharp in the left hand side C uh, in the right hand. That's that's kind of the strongest fingering, but it's hard to get to that from another fingering. Right. So. so so the, the most fluid fingering is two in the left hand with the octave key and one mm. in the right hand. Right. That's less strong, but it's easier to get to, particularly if you have to trill between or do a turn between F sharp and G sharp. Because you can play one and one as F sharp and then go two and one as G sharp. Yeah. So, so that's a helpful, that's a helpful thing to do. Yeah, great. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, so this is this is great. Let me. I had a. Uh, I think before I get into the next questions, I yep. just wanted to ask you. I think you said you had some dates coming up that you wanted to tell us about. Yeah, particularly uh, December twenty second. That's next next Thursday at Cafe Bohemia here in New York. And uh, you know, it's just just a real historically important venue, so I'm looking forward to to playing there next week. Okay, next Thursday. Yeah, well, I would be there if I was in New York. I appreciate you. I appreciate you. But I mean, you know, you came in on a jet last time. Just take the same jet. <laughs> just, you know. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, then, let me. Uh, um, when I do these interviews, I have like uh, some questions I ask okay. everybody. They're just for fun. It's just for fun. Cool. You know, we're not cool. going to hold you to any of these answers. That's okay. It's kind of like, like answer quick. Yeah. And this, you know, they're silly. They kind of they can be silly. It's That's not all right. Serious. That's all right. So I want, um, if you were stranded on a desert island and you yeah. could only have one record or CD or whatever, what would it be? One album. Mm. Uh, Johnny Griffin, Big Soul Band. Okay. And why is that? Any particular reason? Because his sound and his way of playing is so resonant with me and uh it just the 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 way he plays sounds so lyrical that i can almost write out the words as he's playing them he's not the only one i feel like that about but you know short you know quick answer that's the one i'm thinking about all right i love it everyone everyone's like oh i thought he was gonna say a barry a baritone player. <laughs> I mean, you know, I could also say Ronnie Cuba, New, New York Cats. That's another great one. Um, 
or right now in terms of Ron, because I've been listening to so much Ron Cuba because he passed in October. Um, the scene is clean. That's another one that and, and that one, that one hit me right between the eyes. I mean, it hit me. I heard it right at a very formative age when I was very absorbent and it, it affected everything I do with music, even now. All right. Great. Yeah. Uh, okay. So now <clears throat> let's get more specific. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you could listen to only one baritone saxophone player, who would that be? Ronnie Cuber. Okay. And same question, but alto. Tanner Bardley. Okay. And tenor. Johnny Griffin. Okay. See, I love that you're fast. You're fast. Everybody else has to think a long time. That was the fastest three answers. I mean, these, I these are the answers that come out most quickly. I could have said, you know, sure. David Fathead Newman and Stanley Turrentine. Sure. You know, and the you Parker, but, this is not, yeah, we're, not, we're not holding you to this. this I got is, it. I got it. This is how you feel today in That's this moment. That's how I feel in this moment. <laughs> yep. Yep. I'm, I'm, I'm happy with it. Yeah. So uh, what's the last recording you listened to? Most recently, uh, Ronnie Cuber, Passion Fruit. He put out an R and B record in the eighties. All right. What is your favorite non-jazz album? Album. Oh, um, favorite non-jazz album. The whole record, man. I got to think. <laughs> um, Cause I, cause I was getting ready to say songs, but but the whole album. Uh, oh, oh, easy. Uh, Rock him, eighteenth letter. Easy. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I don't know. I don't. Yeah, Eric, Eric B and Rock him, like the rap duo from from the eighties and nineties, but they separated, and so Rock him is my favorite MC of all time, hands down, okay. no exceptions. And his, the record he released, in, I want to say 97, called the eighteenth letter, favorite non jazz album. Easy. Okay. I love it. Yeah, I love it. Easy. All right. What would you rather have stolen, your mouthpiece or your, or your saxophone? Or which would you rather lose? That's not, we don't have to, it doesn't have to be stolen, but which one if you had to choose? Uh, the saxophone, for sure. Because you, you can get closer to your result with the mouthpiece you're familiar with, all other things being equal, than a saxophone you're familiar with and a mouthpiece that doesn't suit you at all. All right. Great. Uh, okay, this is on a technical. Thing. Come on. What's your favorite warm up exercise to do? Ba play a ballad. Generally, I play the bridge uh, from "If You Could See Me Now." That's that's what I do to warm up. I I don't accept that warm up exercises are the only way to warm up, and I find that especially with students, they're so they're typically so caught up in the mechanics that they're always in need. They're always in need of like a musical warm up. Like, yeah, the saxophone is cool, but you're not playing the saxophone to play the saxophone. You're playing the saxophone to make music. So mm -hmm. your musical mechanisms got to be warm too. Yeah. So maybe you can go, you could take, walk us through that a little bit more, like on a typical Jason Marshall practice session, the first 15 minutes, what would that include? Playing ballads, playing ballads, uh, just trying to get all the the difficult sort of transitions, like getting from F to F sharp to G in the altissimo, being able to, you know, kind of warm my pinky fingers up, playing in the very bottom of the horn. Um, and and at that point, I'm just improvising. Like I'm not, I'm not, I don't have warm up, sort of patterns and things. Although uh, I should mention that a, a, a mentor of mine, uh, the, the great bass player, now the saxophone player also, Mike Karn, he talked about playing the uh, Marcel Mule 48 studies and the the, the Sigurd Rascher, um, I want to say 158, 158 studies, something like the Brown Book, anyway. Yeah. Um, he would do one of those every day which is to say the whole book in one sitting one okay. of those, you know, and it would, you know, it might take him 90 minutes to do the whole thing of either one, 
but it, it left him feeling a certain kind of proficient at the end of that. So I've considered uh, just spending some time doing that. I've never really been into A2 books or classical saxophone, if I'm going to be honest. Um, part of that is because one of my first trip to Paris, I, I went to the, um, this is 2005, I got a chance to go to the Van Doren uh, kind of uh, factory museum space that they had and uh they have a video of marcel mule uh talking about a lot of things but also the time he got to meet charlie parker and they asked him because he was older than bird he just li he lived to be you know 101 i think um but he uh he said yeah. so i heard uh, the, the the interviewer says uh, you know I, I i understand that you met you know, Charlie Parker, he said, yeah. And he said, what did you think when you heard him play? He says, he wasn't very good. And I didn't want to hear anything else to do with Marcel <laughs> Mule after that. Like, I, I remember walking out the room. I said, let's go have lunch. I don't want to hear anything else he got to say. Isn't that, so I, I've never heard that, but I find yeah. that kind of shocking that they would be broadcasting that inside of Andorran. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, I mean, but, it, you know, it's all, it's, it's, it's contextual, right? Like, in, the, in that moment, I don't know if, if Charlie Parker was a was a a known commodity worthy of any respect, I can't imagine that he wasn't. But for 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 Marcel Mule, wherever he was in the time and space he was in, that might have been an acceptable way of thinking. I would embarrass I would be embarrassed to have that opinion of Charlie Parker. Um, but I'm also not embarrassed to not think very much of Marcel Mule as a result, right? So, you know, I've said okay. That's him, but but it also means I don't need to listen to any more of this. Mm. So it took me years to get over that to where I would even crack open those books that he put out. Uh, and I think, you know, that's one way to develop some proficiency with the instrument. You know, I will say um, one of one of the more edifying experiences I had in grad school was when I studied with Ralph Bowen, and he actually showed me how to hear the music in classical etudes because that was a, that was the struggle for me was that I, I can't hear any music in it so it doesn't it doesn't resonate with me i don't understand what this is supposed to do and he says well let me let me play them for you and he goes okay you hear that that's a five to one chord i said oh okay and so he starts making making it make sense to me and then i found that to be very helpful yeah in defense of those books um most of that music, as far as I understand it, was not written by Marcel Mule. He okay. was taking transcription. He was transcribing flute books okay. and oboe books okay. in, and just putting it out as saxophone, changing uh, the okay. working. Yeah. He did, I believe, make some exercise books that I think he wrote. Okay. You can correct me if I'm wrong here, but okay. a lot of that, the, the, like the, the famous ones, that was came from other instruments. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Well, I mean, you know, for 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 the little bit I I was exposed to him, and and yeah. based on what I understood, it didn't strike me. But over the years, I had other people help that help me understand them in different ways, and and mm -hmm. they have become somewhat more useful. But I've I'm in a I'm in a, a a period in my life where I'm going back to see what I can gain from things that initially didn't resonate with me. Yeah, and that's yeah. that's something that happens, right? Over well, yeah, and you get older, right? Of course, and then you know, in terms of practicing, my practicing was always playing music. Mm. You know, uh, so I'll play music until I find a space where I feel like I need to work out something technical, and then I'll work that thing out. I, you know, I'll sort of loop a, a particular, you know, uh, arpeggio or a particular phrase that I'm trying to trying to figure out, and. Uh, then I figured it out and I'll go go on to playing music. Because for me, in order for me to absorb music, I always have to leave it in the context of music. Yeah. Taking it, take, you know, zooming into the to the level of scales and arpeggios never landed with me as well as hearing the scales and arpeggios in the context of music. All right. Yeah, I like it. It's great because as you say, there is a general imbalance when it comes to practice routines for a lot of people where it's just like, okay, exercise, exercise, exercises. 
but I have some time at the end to play a song, you know, <laughs> where, and, and then it's great talking to uh, lots of um, great players. And this is a common theme. Like, yeah, start out playing a tune. Yeah. And that's, so that's you know, the point. Different, but yeah, that's the point. Yeah. The music. Yeah. You know, I, listen, I mean, the internet is full of people that's good at doing exercises and can't still can't play any music. Sure. So for me, that's, that's the whole point is to play the music, you know? And so when you, the, the, the point of the exercises is to make playing music easier, yeah. not to get better at playing exercises. Right. Which ends up what a lot of people get good at, really yeah. good at exercises and not. So, you know, and it's like, you could just look at, you know, maybe look at playing music. That's your exercise. That's yeah, your exercise. exactly. You know? Exactly. <laughs> tunes, you know. It's like, it's like functional fitness. It's yeah. the same, right? Like, okay, a deadlift is a deadlift, but it's not really about the deadlift so much as it is about like, don't throw your back out carrying luggage. You know, right. be able to carry your groceries in from the car without it taking all day. You know, like it's those yeah. being able to lift your children up. Yeah, that's the. It's not the kettlebells. It's like don't hurt yourself living your life. Yeah. And so with music, I think of it very much in that way. Yeah, that's a fun way to practice too, mm -hmm. because it's not you get your you get out of this you know this thing. So yeah, that's that's definitely something a good takeaway. Let's, uh, I got a few more. Okay, before, come on. Before we run out of time here. Uh, what is your favorite chord quality? Mm. Wow, I never heard, never heard anyone ask me that. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you just had a bit like, you know, I just, it's just in a moment, you know. The, the, your... the tricky part is I don't, I don't think of chords in isolation. I think of progressions. Um, okay. But, a Great, seven, a, favorite a seven chord. Uh, my favorite progression is a is a bird blues. Actually, we we used to call them hopping John changes because it's it's a it's, it starts it's a blues. It's twelve bar blues uh, form, but when it goes to the four chord and four minor, it it, it goes two five one, then two five one down a whole step, and then three six two five in the original key. So sometimes sometimes people call them sharpshooter changes because it was on a Cannonball record called Sharpshooter. Uh, Hoppin' John is the song I think that first featured that uh, that progression. So some people call them Hoppin' John changes, but that's a you know right. the one, then the minor two five, and then two five one to the four chord, and then you know a lot of tunes like that. I like them. All right, I love it. Okay, what about what's your favorite tempo or groove playing? I like all of them but ballads because yes. for me the 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 point is the the sound and with a ballad you can you can get you can be most effective with your sound all right um and if you had to choose one favorite standard what would it be well i don't know if it's a standard but hard times by paul mitchell Made famous by David Fathead Newman. Okay, I love that too. Yeah, I recorded it on my last album called Joy Unspeakable. Hmm. Yeah. Great. All right, and now this is the last one. Mm -hmm. And I now in my conversations with you, you you talk about this a lot, mm -hmm. uh, but I find this is like one of the most important things in all the interviews I do is mm -hmm. asking people about their mentors. So I know you've had a lot, as I've, everybody uh, yeah. has. Yeah, but maybe if you could single out one and just talk about, you know, why they were so important to you. That's hard because I had so many good ones. Um, uh, I mean, like it's, 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 it's that's that's a that's a really hard one. Um, I'll, I'll talk about Ronnie Cuba, but leading up to Ronnie Cuba, I had you know, Paul Carr and Lawrence Wheatley and Nasser Abaday and Thad Wilson and Antonio Parker. And I mean, folks I grew up around that really uh, made sure, Fred Foss is another one um, 
that they're, you know, folks that just really made sure that I, I, I had a good start. Right. Um, when I, when I got to New York, Ronnie Huber was, was the most influential on me in terms of the way to play music. And personally, our, our relationship took a lot of turns because of his personal, his kind of social way, you know, he had a, he had a quite intense sort of way with him, but especially when I was younger, taking lessons with him, uh, which I started even before I moved to New York, he, he, he showed me so much about how to make the instrument relevant in modern music and how not to get stuck in the, you know, Harry Carney, then Pepper Adams, and maybe Jerry Mulligan, the end. Because for, for all intents and purposes, that's kind of where people have left the baritone with the exception of Ronnie Cuber. You know, Ronnie Cuber brought the instrument into the modern era. And, uh, you know, so in terms of mentorship, he just kind of led by example with the instrument, you know, and then who, who, who helped me round out the edges was, was Howard Johnson. Cause Howard, the thing about Howard was that he, he made being weird. Cool. You know, he made like, playing all the weird instruments and playing weird music and just being a nerd about music. He made that cool. Um, but, but I got to say, Ronnie, you know, and, and the thing about Ronnie, he just set the bar so high that he left room for, to develop under that bar and then, you know, try and achieve that and then take it to another, another level up. But man, Ronnie, cause, cause the thing about Ronnie was like the, it was inspiring to hear and it made you kind of want to be competitive and like be great just at playing the instrument and sound strong and be effective. And, 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 you know, the thing about Ronnie for me, I got to say right now is that he made music compelling, right? Cause he's not the first person to be technically proficient on the instrument, but when you hear it, it's compelling. And for me now, a compelling presentation is the most important thing. So I gotta say, Ronnie, for me, and 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 honestly, I just I haven't really heard anyone else except for I gotta mention his name, Sharantha Bedigi. He's up in Canada. That I mean, he's the only person where where when I heard him on the baritone, I I imagine that we we like the same music. You know, there are other instrumentalists that I, I respect greatly on the baritone. But when I heard Charanth, I was like, wow, OK, we, we like the same stuff. Um, but especially in New York, there's kind of nobody else doing doing it like this. Uh, and not that they have to. But, you know, when Ronnie passed away uh, on Pepper Adams birthday, um, it, it became very clear that I was doing the thing that without Ronnie, sort of left me on this lily pad alone, uh, which, you know, I'm still processing, so. Yeah, so, yeah, you've <clears throat> kind of carrying on yeah. a, a legacy. Yeah. An important one, and it's, yeah, yeah well, I'm sure uh, it'd be very, I don't know if you got to hear any of your um, latest album, but I'm sure you'd be proud of. I hope you did. I hope you did. Yeah, well, that's a poignant place to leave it. I appreciate it. Um, let's do this again sometime. Yeah, let's, man, I enjoyed this.